So we're doing some more Christian practices today. There's Professor Rosa from the University of Berkshire. She's very up for this, aren't you, Professor? Getting a haircut tomorrow. Ro Professor, can you look up? She has no eyes at the moment. They disappeared. So pilgrimage. Pilgrimage is a religious journey, a journey to a place of special religious importance. Why would you go on a pilgrimage? Well, firstly, it allows you to focus on your faith. You can focus just on your religion without the day-to-day -day, uh, distractions of real life, for example, sort of a job or your family. You can dedicate time purely to your religion. It shows your commitment and dedication. You're willing to go on this journey, spend the money, and spend the effort to go to this place. It shows God your dedication. It helps you to understand and appreciate the historical events in your religion and what previous members of your religion have gone through, possibly. One of these historical events is the St. Bernadette's miracle. St. Bernadette was a young girl living in the town of Lourdes in northern France. She has visions of the Virgin Mary. So she stares up at this uh, cave, and above the cave she can see the Virgin Mary, and the Virgin Mary speaks to her. So Bernadette can speak back to her in Latin, a language that she shouldn't have understood. Everyone's like, whoa, where did you learn that? And she's like, I don't know. So eventually she is told to dig in the ground, and she finds a source of water. That water is considered now to be holy water. Okay? The water there is said to have these powers. The powers that most people attribute to it is that it's meant to uh, heal you. So lots of sick people go to this place in order to be healed. They'll go with various illnesses. Not all of them are expecting a miracle, but they think their faith and the waters themselves will help them it, like, to be healed in many occasions. There are miracles attributed to the waters there. Whether they're real or not is a matter of debate. The other place of pilgrimage that we can talk about in the exam is Iona. Iona is in Scotland. It's an island off the coast of Scotland, discovered by this guy, St. Columba, okay, or just Columba. You can talk, call him either of them. Not Columbus, Columba. He's an Irish monk who finds the island and forms a monastery on it. A monastery is obviously where monks live. He builds the monastery... And people visit hundreds of years to see the monastery. Eventually, in the like 1800s, the monastery shuts down. It gets started up again, essentially, in 1938. And by that time, people are visiting the island to experience two things. One, the peace and tranquility of where the monks live, so they could focus on praying and focus on God. And two, they experience the beauty of the island and what the people, and what St. Columba described as, the thin place. Bust that out as a quote if you need to, okay, in an emergency. The thin place, where the gap between like reality and the heavens is at its thinnest and you are as close to something heavenly as possible that's why they call it the thin place the gap between heavens and earth is so thin there because it is so beautiful and peaceful in that way festivals oh, it should be with a set on the end or festival i drew some balloons for the festival and this little man is flying away with the balloons see F fun christmas Biggest Christian festival in some ways, okay, certainly the most famous, if not maybe the most important. It celebrates the birth of Jesus, but more importantly, it celebrates the incarnation of Jesus, God taking human form, okay? That is a massively important moment for Christians. His two well, his most important moments, obviously, his incarnation and his death and resurrection. So Christmas celebrates the birth and incarnation. We remember the miracle of his birth. It is a virgin birth, the Virgin Mary. That shows how special this birth is. So we remember that. We remember his humble beginnings and the gifts given to him by the kings. At his birth, he's bowed down to by shepherds and kings, the highest in society and the lowest in society. We can see from this that Jesus is going to be the ruler of all, not just of kings, not just of shepherds. He's going to be the ruler of everyone. How do we celebrate this time? Well, uh, Professor Rosa, we do not get too excited and bark at things in the garden. That was just clearly nothing at all. You're an idiot. It brings people together, okay, the festival. It brings people together, uh, say, at church services or at family events, okay? That's one massively important thing. It's a time to give thanks and to help others, okay? We give people gifts, we receive gifts. Why do we give and receive gifts? Well, Jesus received gifts from the kings, okay, those gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Every good gift and, a pr and pr uh, every good gift and perfect gift is from above. So every gift given and received is from God. We can use that as justification for why gifts are exchanged 
during uh, Christmas celebrations. Other events they might ask you to write about or you could use, Midnight Mass, a celebration often on Christmas Eve where Christians will go to church and take in the body and the blood of Christ in the terms of uh, bread and wine to remember Christ. The Nativity, plays put on that reenact the story of Christ's birth to remember the event. This is an important event in the history of the religion, so we're going to reenact it because it's important. Carols, singing Christmas carols. The other festival you can talk about easily is Easter, okay? Easter remembers the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The crucifixion and resurrection. It starts on Palm Sunday. Now, Palm Sunday is the Sunday before Easter, and that's when Jesus rocks up into town riding on a donkey, and the people put palm leaves all in his route. And it ends on Easter Monday, essentially. So in between that, you've got Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. Maundy Thursday is the day of the Last Supper. Good Friday is the day that he dies. Easter Sunday is the day that he resurrects. And Easter Monday is the day that he reappears. So those are important days. Church services, remembering Christ's sacrifice and rebirth, okay? So you'll often go to church during this time. You will not mention the giving of chocolate eggs, okay? Jesus did not give a chocolate egg. He didn't lay a chocolate egg. He wasn't born inside a chocolate egg. No mention of chocolate eggs. You don't even need to go into that thing that we tell primary school kids that, oh, the egg represents the stone that was rolled over the tomb. Focus on the ideas of his death and rebirth, and you can focus on these events. On the Thursday, which is obviously to me- the Maundy Thursday, which is when he was uh, having his last supper you can go and do mass or eucharist you can go and have the bread and wine at church to remember that jesus christ had his last meal on this day friday to sunday at the church different events the lighting of the paschal candle okay the lighting of this candle shows that jesus is the light in our life that his light never goes out he is the light we follow in the darkness and the liturgy of the words church services where the bible and christ's words are read to us it's a time firstly of mourning for jesus's death we are sad that he died however we are happy that he has been resurrected and we celebrate his resurrection think of a number Okay, I'm thinking of a number. What is the role of the church? What is the, oh, you can't see that. What is the role of the church? Well, the role of the church is to, uh, it needs to the church needs to work to help others, okay? Charity, support groups, food banks, all things you can talk about. Support groups can be stuff like Alcoholics Anonymous, Drugs Anonymous, mother and toddler groups that run at the church, often for free, to help the community. Charity is obviously any form of charity run through the church. Food banks. Food made available for people in poverty. We'll talk more about poverty later. Why is this done? Well, firstly, easiest thing is the parable of the sheep and goats. The parable of the sheep and goats can be a reference to scripture. You don't need to quote it. Just say, in the Bible, Jesus talks of the parable of the sheep and goats. This is where Jesus goes, look, some of you are sheep. Some of you are goats. You want to be sheep listening to me and doing what I say. Then you'll be rewarded in heaven. You don't want to be goats going around doing anything and doing your own thing and being selfish. Then you won't come to heaven. And because you're sheep and goats, I'm testing you all the time. When someone poor comes up to you begging for money, that is me, Jesus, testing you through them and seeing if you'll be a good sheep and help them or a bad goat and ignore them. Okay, you don't want to be a bad goat. That's the worst kind of goat to be. How do some churches do this? Well, famous examples are street pastors. Okay, that is pastors, P-A-S-T-O-R-S, not as in spaghetti that you find on the road. You're not allowed to eat that. That's what I learned. Street pastors are Christians who go out on the streets of Britain late at night, especially on Friday and Saturday nights when people are drinking and being crazy, and they go and help people and give assistance to people. They might just hand out food, they might uh, help people who have sort of like hurt themselves or got too drunk, and they make sure they get home safe. Love thy neighbour. Then we have the Salvation Army. Salvation Army is a large Christian group that follow Christ's example of helping everybody. They do food kitchens, drug rehabilitation. It's about joining together, okay? Let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth, okay? We need to not love just with words or speech. We need to actually do something. The Salvation Army do something. They go and help people. If you needed to criticise it for a 12 mark question, you could criticise the fact that the Salvation Army do try and spread the message. There is a pressure to like convert to Christianity. Just in it back, I didn't think about 12 mark questions for pilgrimages. 12 mark question for pilgrimage, obviously saying why a pilgrimage is a good thing is really obvious, okay? It helps you. I've said all that stuff at the start, brings you closer to God. A nice negative against pilgrimage is the amount of money that it costs. Pilgrimages are expensive. Why not give that money to charity? 
Okay, so this can be an argument against pilgrimage. Yeah, I shouldn't go on pilgrimage. I should go and do charity and work at home. Why should I be so selfish as to go on this journey for myself? I need to go and help the church and help my fellow man. Another thing I could do instead of going on pilgrimage is I could do evangelism or go on a mission. Okay, evangelism is church growth, spreading the word of God and the truth. The church will grow and become more peaceful as everyone will be one in God. The truth of God should be spread to everyone because everyone deserves a place in heaven. God is omnibenevolent. He can love an infinite number of people. You're never going to find too many people to love God, so we should try and convert everyone. Some churches believe that evangelism is an essential part of faith. Okay, Famously, not that many Christians who are considered the main part of the Christian family, but groups that are similar to Christianity, Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, for example, have evangelism and missions as a central part of their faith. However, lots of Christians do like evangelism. They'll often go to places and try and spread the faith. Go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. A disciple is a follower. Jesus, is had, Jesus had 12 disciples. So we're going to make disciples of all nations. All nations should follow God. Easy peasy, we're all united in Christ. Missions is just going to a specific place to go and spread the word of God, often in developing nations. How can we criticise evangelism missions? Well, you might claim that they could cause conflict, that spreading their religion to people who might not be receptive to it might cause conflict between those groups. So is it a good thing? Well, no, we could be spreading conflict. And you could argue that, you know, oh, how do they know this is a true religion? But don't forget, you're going to be arguing from a Christian point of view. So you might want to argue, oh, we should respect people's free will or we should allow people to come to Christ themselves. In a technological age, people can find information about God. There's better things we can do than spreading the religion. Why am I not going on uh, a pilgrimage? Why am I going uh, to do evangelism when I could be going on pilgrimage and sort of helping my faith? Why am I not giving to charity when I could, instead of doing evangelism? I'm not helping anyone directly. Persecution and reconciliation. Persecution and reconciliation. So, persecution is to be ill-treated normally because of your prejudices, okay? You're prejudiced against a group, you persecute them. Many Christians were persecuted, okay? Jesus was persecuted. He got nailed to a cross because they didn't like him. That is persecution. So, we should expect to be persecuted and we have got different ways we should react to it. We should react to it with love and forgiveness, all right? Blessed are the persecuted. If you're persecuted against, you're picked on, you're going to go to heaven if you deal with it right, because it's a test from God. Okay. Even if we're persecuted, we know it's part of God's plan. You can link to Job. Job, you could say, was persecuted by God, and yet he still finds love from God in the end. So even if we're persecuted, respect God and know that this is part of the plan. An example of this could be Brother Andrew. Okay, Brother Andrew. He smuggled Bibles into Soviet Russia. He's an example of someone who was persecuted, he was attacked, he was punished, and he still smuggled the Bibles in, snuck himself in to try and convert people. You could use him for evangelism as well, really. Brother Andrew is useful like that. So he's an evangelist who spreads his faith, but he's willing to put up with persecution to do it. Blessed are the persecuted. Reconciliation is coming to peace between two groups who are at conflict. Okay? Forgive and you'll be forgiven. Judge and you'll be judged. You must forgive the other person. We should be promoting forgiveness. Jesus' death was God's reconciliation with us, so we must try and reenact that reconciliation with others who have fallen out, whether it is us or whether it's other groups. A big famous example is Corrie Mela, all one word, C-O-R-R-Y-M-E-E-L-A. It's Christians in Ireland in this village or town, I don't know quite how you describe it, who live together in this community uh, saying that it doesn't matter what sort of Christian you are, when you're in this place, we all live together in peace. It's trying to suggest that coming together in peace is the most important thing. It shouldn't matter that you're different types of Christian who are fighting in Ireland and Northern Ireland. We should find reconciliation in God's love. Poverty and charity. Why? Why should we care about poverty and charity? Well, we are all God's children, so we need to look after each other. And the story of the sheep and the goats again. We know that we're being tested to look after the poor. Blessed are, uh, blessed are the poor. I mean, that is in there, okay? Sell all you have and give to the poor. We should be doing everything we can to help those who are in need. Okay, three groups they could ask about technically because they are on the spec. Cathod, the Catholic... Uh, that word is meant to be agency, but it clearly says agents. Agents say agency. Oh, I don't know where the green pen. Oh, there's the green pen. Literally was next to it. Agency. 
agency for overseas development. They go around the world helping people. Christian Aid, Christian charity that helps all people no matter what faith they are. We're all God's children. Tear Fund, a UK-based charity for helping poverty and disaster relief. If there's been an earthquake, expect Tear Fund to want to turn up for it. Choose which one you want to write about in your exam. I would go Christian Aid, because I think it's the easiest name to remember, because it has the word Christian in it. They're all doing a similar thing, which is helping everyone no matter what, because we are all God's children. We are meant to love one another. Bang, love thy neighbour. Easy, it's our favourite quote. Why? Well, we sell all we can and give to the poor, so we can give to these charities. Saving our fellow man is always good. God wants us to save each other. This can be considered a good deed. Arguments against charity and poverty, difficult because obviously these things are good, but you could say at a real stretch that maybe poverty is not our problem, it's not our fault, we should focus on our own souls and not the souls of others. Poverty is often caused by government's actions, so why are they not dealing with it? But as a whole point of view, poverty and charity is normally a difficult one to argue against. Just try and argue things are as important, like having a personal relationship with God through prayer, or worshipping God at church as we are told to do these things, or converting the world to Christianity so the world is a fairer place through evangelism. Okay? Oh, was it the number? Well, what number was I thinking of? Let's see what number it was. It was the number egg. 